Uh, my name is Dr. Scott Scherr, and again, it's a pleasure to be here. We're going to be talking about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's one of my specialties, along with health optimization medicine. I want to thank again Julia and Mick and the crew for having me. I'm an internal medicine physician. I'm based in the Bay Area. I specialize in health optimization medicine and hyperbaric therapy. This lecture is powered by Blue Canatine. It is our for-profit company that is the for-profit arm of our nonprofit health optimization medicine which I'll talk about as well. So I'm a clinician and I've been in practice for over 10 years in the Bay Area. My initial focus was integrative hyperbaric therapy and integrative hyperbaric therapy really was my first foray, foray outside of conventional practice. Hyperbaric therapy as we'll talk about is a very amazing and very uh, synergistic tool. And so I, I, I often say that breathe, heal, synergize and accelerate. That's really what we're doing in the chamber. All you need to do is breathe. Um, anyway, so I, I specialized in hyperbaric therapy and I developed a practice around hyperbaric therapy for about eight years or so, but I always felt that there was something missing to it. And it really was a foundation, a clinical foundation to the work I was doing. And we call this clinically measured holobiont hacking. Really what it is for all you biohackers is a framework for all your crazy biohacking. And I work with a lot of people in the biohacking space, in the optimal performance space, using a combination of both hyperbaric therapy and health optimization medicine, sometimes one, sometimes the other. I recommend both most of the time. You can find me at integrativehbot.com, my hyperbaric company called hbot.plus, and home-sf.co. Those are the places you can find me. Um, but let's, let's kind of dive into this. The first aspect of my practice that I developed was hyperbaric medicine. Hyperbaric therapy is the intermittent administration of 100% oxygen at increased atmospheric pressure. Uh, before we get into oxygen and pressure, because that's really all hyperbaric therapy is, we're going to talk about some definitions. So when you're at 3 ATA, this last one here, you're at 66 feet of seawater. All the water above you is exerting a pressure on you. And we're actually using that pressure. We're harnessing that pressure inside a hyperbaric environment, simulating the feeling you would have under a certain amount of seawater. 2 ATA is 33 feet of seawater, and 1 ATA is sea level. I didn't circle it here, but in an airplane, we used to take those. Remember, guys, when we were you know, pre-COVID, taking airplanes all the time? When you're on an airplane, you're actually pressurized to 8,000 feet above sea level, which means you're at decreased atmospheric pressure. And what we're going to find out in a minute is that that actually is decreased amount of oxygen in the air as well. And most of you guys know that already from Mount Everest and and being on a mountain and knowing that it's harder to breathe in those situations. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is oxygen. Now, oxygen is kind of important. Important Without it, we die very quickly. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse or the energy producing organelle of our cells. And without that extra, without that oxygen, we can't make energy. Most of us do a very good job already saturating red blood cells of which we have many in our system and we have hemoglobin uh, that is the molecule that that the oxygen attaches to so there's four of them per red blood cell and then if you're a normal individual 97 to 100 percent of those sites <laughs> my kids sorry guys i'm home um, are actually already bound by oxygen once you have a normal breath in sea level air which is 21 percent oxygen the question is how can we increase the amount of oxygen in circulation even more if you already have bound 97 to 100% of those sites. Well, there's a couple ways. Lance Armstrong and many others will do things to increase the amount of red blood cell mass, so the amount of red blood cells that are in circulation. And by doing that, you're increasing the amount of oxygen carrying capacity. But in a chamber, we do that in a different way. We increase atmospheric pressure, like I was talking about in that first graph with being underwater. So what we're doing in the chamber is we're increasing the amount of atmospheric pressure. And by doing that, we're actually increasing the amount of oxygen that's diffusing into the plasma or the liquid of your blood. The liquid of your blood has very little oxygen in it at baseline, <laughs> at sea level. And what we can do by increasing the amount of pressure is increasing the amount of oxygen that's diffused into the plasma itself. And so this plasma oxygen is liquid O2. It's free floating oxygen. And we can get over 1200% more oxygen in circulation. As an example, at three atmospheres absolute or 66 feet of seawater, you actually don't need red blood cells anymore 
to transport enough oxygen to maintain your physiologic needs. So we're actually using this clinically in people that have acute trauma and blood loss. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, for example, you don't want to have a, a blood transfusion. What you can do here is you can go into a hyperbaric chamber and temporize because you can get so much oxygen diffused in the plasma. Okay, so in the immediacy, once you acutely get into a hyperbaric chamber, you're gonna get this huge amount of oxygen in circulation, okay? And that's gonna do a number of different things. It's going to constrict down blood vessels. This is actually very important if you've had an injury and that blood vessel is broken and leaking out things that shouldn't get outside of a blood vessel. Constricting down that blood vessel is going to allow less of that stuff to come out and cause swelling. And then as we're increasing the amount of oxygen in the plasma, we're actually delivering more oxygen to tissue. And as a result of that, we're able to save tissue. So if you've had a heart attack, if you've had a stroke, if you've had a spinal cord injury, if you've had any other acute trauma where there's oxygen deficit, we can diffuse 1200% more oxygen in circulation. And as a result of that, we're going to protect or save some of that tissue. So it's being used clinically in traumatic brain injury, in stroke, in heart attacks, in spinal cord injuries and others to save tissue in the acute setting. We're also decreasing inflammation and pain releasing stem cells acutely. So stem cells are these baby cells that can make any other cell in your body. We're increasing neutrophil and macrophage activation, which helps with the process of wound healing. We're killing bugs, especially those do not, that do not like high oxygen environments. And we're potentiating antibiotics if they're used in combination, especially to kill bugs. This is how I first learned about hyperbaric therapy, actually, which, it, which was in um, flesh-eating bacteria, which is when this bacteria that starts killing off your limbs and people have to get amputations in combination with uh, antibiotics and hyperbaric therapy you can save people's limbs and lives and i've seen this firsthand it also interestingly enough we think enhances flow and what i mean by this is it enhances blood flow and lymphatic flow by creating more easy water this is a term that was coined by a guy named dr gerald pollock who is a researcher at the university of washington so you know, my world is in the clinical world. So I use hyperbaric therapy clinically with patients and I've been using it this way for over 10 years. Now, the power of a hyperbaric protocol though is the epigenetic effects that occur in over 8,000 different genes. And this is a protocol of therapy that could be anywhere from five sessions to as many as 120 sessions, depending on the indication. But what we're doing here is we're changing the expression of various genes and optimizing them for healing and for growth and for downregulating inflammation. So that's really what we're talking about here. Optimizing all stages of wound healing, new blood vessels forming, antioxidant upregulation. All that oxygen that's going into circulation is going to cause an oxidative stress in the system, which actually is kind of like exercise on some level. It allows the body to kind of come back stronger. And that's what's happening in the chamber. We're also decreasing senescent cell populations, which are these cells that are called zombie cells that are associated with cancer, degeneration, aging, et cetera, and then down-regulating inflammation. I like to think about it as sort of scaffold building, like you're building the scaffold of a building. You have to rebuild the scaffolding of tissue because of injuries, because of aging, because of injury of, of any type, really. So in summary, what we're doing in a chamber is reversing hypoxia, so reversing low oxygen states immediately by acutely infusing all that oxygen. And over the long term, we're creating new blood vessels in that tissue to sustain blood flow and oxygenation over the long term. We're decreasing inflammation. We're doing that immediately and then also over the long term by epigenetic shifts. We're causing stem cell release, which are these baby cells that can make any new cell in the body or any old cell that needs to be replaced. We're killing bugs especially bugs that do not like high oxygen environments, and we're enhancing blood and lymphatic flow. So this is the first type of chamber that was developed. It's called a multi-place chamber. This is from a particular facility called the Segal Center for Hyperbaric Medicine, and this is in Israel. The Israelis have the largest hyperbaric facility in the world. They're treating over 250 patients per day, mostly in their reverse aging program. What they've developed is a way to do a battery of diagnostics beforehand, and then do hyperbaric therapy with a couple of therapeutics during, and then do the same battery of di diagnostics afterwards. Some of those diagnostics, including uh, functional sc scanning of their brain, so MRI scans, but not just looking at a static picture of the brain, but actually looking at the metabolism of the brain and how things change over time. 
they've done this of the brain, they've done this of the heart, and they've done it of the genital regions and have actually published studies on cognitive enhancement in hyperbaric therapy. They've, they're going to be publishing studies on increasing what's called your VO2 max or your cardiac output using hyperbaric therapy. And they've published a study on erectile dysfunction. This is what gets the guys in Israel to go into the chamber, giving them pictures of a penis before and a penis afterwards and seeing how blood flow changes. Sometimes I present that particular picture. I have to be very careful and very upfront and to say, this is not my penis, this is somebody else's. <laughs> um, because I've gotten some of these tests myself as well when I was in Israel back in 2018. Um, but I can say this could be your dick. <laughs> um, so this is for the aging population, but these are for patients that are actually normal. They don't have any major medical issues, but just wanna optimize. Sound familiar, guys? So the multi-place chamber was then developed into a single unit chamber called a monoplace chamber. The most fam famous inhabitant of a monoplace chamber is actually Michael Jackson. He was actually filmed and pictured in a monoplace chamber when he was giving it to a burn center after he used it for third degree burns after he was burned from a Pepsi commercial back in the 1980s. These are, these are medical grade chambers. They go to three ATA, which is 66 feet of seawater. These guys go much deeper. They can be used for dive related injuries as well. Uh, which is how hyperbaric therapy first came along, by the way. And the final chamber that was developed is something called the soft or mild-sided hyperbaric chamber. I like to call these the neurohacker special. Those are kind of buzzwords for you guys, right? We're talking about a chamber that can be portable, that goes to less pressure, that can be used for like a neurocognitive optimization strategy, and also one that can be used with stacking other technologies together. If you guys have interest in soft or mild hyperbaric therapy, I did a very long and in-depth article for Ben Greenfield's blog about a month ago where I went into detail about all of these different types of chambers and how they can be used. But I like to think about this one as sort of the milder one that can be stacked with other therapies and actually you can bring things inside these chambers where you can't bring things in the other chambers as well. So you can bring in your neurofeedback, you can bring in your meditation devices, you can bring in your HRV devices, lots of other different things and stack along the way. So uh, approved indications in the hyper, in, of hyperbaric therapy in the US. This is the list, look at it. I can give you guys the slides afterwards. I'm not gonna go through these today. Suffice to say that I learned about it in the acute setting for necrotizing soft tissue infections, but I see a lot of di diabetic foot ulcers, a lot of delayed radiation injury as well. These are patients that have had radiation in the past for cancer and now have radiation injury as a result of that. Where I have a lot of fun and where most of you are in the frame is in the investigational indications. These are the things that have a lot of research behind them, but they're not currently being uh, covered by medical insurance in the US. So regenerative medicine, combining hyperbaric therapy with PRP, with stem cell therapy, with exosomes. I've done this personally for myself and my back actually, uh, but I've used it with patients over the years, uh, many fold, optimal performance, like I was talking about with the Israeli protocols, but also stroke and cancer and reflex sympathetic dystrophy, chronic pain syndromes, traumatic brain injury, Lyme disease, optimizing pre-post surgery. So getting into a chamber before you get surgery will optimize your surgical recovery and maybe cut your surgical recovery in half. And I've seen this many times. Don't forget dementia. Some people care about that. If you're 85 in the US, you have a, uh, you have a, a, you have a one in three chance, actually, I'm sorry, two in three chance of getting dementia. So a pretty high chance. So my simple rules here, if you have an acute injury and you want to heal faster, getting into a chamber is going to help you. Honestly, it doesn't matter what type of chamber, but the type of injury will sort of relegate you to what the best chamber may be. If it's more of a central nervous system injury, then the soft chambers may be helpful. But in general, I use the hard chambers when possible, even for acute injuries. And you're going to want to synergize your therapy your hyperbaric therapy with targeted biohacking strategies. I like to call this the educated throwing shit at the wall strategy. Now, I do this in a clinical way because obviously I'm a clinician, so I think about this in a very clinical way given what's worked with other patients over the years. But you're looking at a targeted biohacking strategy. 
And the acute injuries really will get better using hyperbaric therapy because you have this inflammatory response. We're going to decrease inflammation. We're going to get oxygen to tissue. We're going to decrease pain. We're going to get stem cells released, and we're going to cause healing to start happening faster. But if you have more of a chronic condition, and I'll include aging in that, or you're looking to optimize, getting into a chamber right away may not be what you want to do. You want to do your homework first, your health optimization medicine work first. This is clinically measured holobiont hacking. This is the new biohacking, honestly. This is a, a, what I feel is a more holistic and a, a more significant foundation and framework for the biohacking that all of you are likely doing. What is the framework you're using to optimize your health? And that's what health optimization medicine is all about. And so it was founded by this guy, Dr. Ted Atricoso. Dr. Ted pioneered health optimization medicine in practice. And I signed on to be the, the chief operating officer of the nonprofit in 2017, so over three years ago. Because I truly felt that there needed to be a different framework than was already out there that was really focused on health and not disease. Doctor, this is Dr. Ted's slide. It's one of my favorites. Um, and I don't think he'll care that I'm using it. I didn't tell him this time around. But even functional medicine, which is a fantastic field, and I have lots of clinician friends and colleagues that I refer to in the functional medicine world, it's still looking at root cause illness, right? It's still looking at those root causes. And there is some crossover here, but we're truly focused Instead of, instead of diagnosing and treating even the root cause of disease, we're truly focused on directing, detecting and correcting imbalances. If you're detecting and correcting imbalances, you are optimizing the cellular matrix. You're optimizing for metabolites, which we'll talk about in a minute. And you're not focused, you're setting disease aside. And it's a different focus, not that you're not also addressing some of the underly underlying reasons why people may have diseases, but that's not our focus. And we're not doing disease management here, we're doing health management. And this is dear to my heart because I grew up the son of a chiropractor who didn't even address disease at all. It was all about putting the body back in alignment. And that's what we're doing really here from a cellular perspective. And instead of lifespan, we, we care about, I call it the fountain of youth, or we can call it health span. The idea of as many good years on this planet as possible, until we're not here any longer in this dimension. So that's really the difference. You know, we get a lot of questions about what's different between health optimization medicine and functional medicine. It's just a shift in perspective. The testing is different too. We're not focused on looking at that root cause. We're focused on what's gonna be optimizing your health from the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of the benefit for 20% of the testing. And then you refer to a functional medicine provider. And I have lots of them, like I said. We use something called the holobiont. The holobiont is the idea that we're made up of multiple populations of organisms within us. And this all is what makes us us. Whoop, I don't want to go that far yet. Sorry. Um, so it's not just you know, we're made of human cells. We're made up of microbiota. We're made up of fungus, bacteria, the foods we eat. And so the genome is here. We have our host. We have our environment. And we're looking at detecting and correcting subtle toxicities and deficiencies within this perspective, talking about exogenous metabolites. So these are what we can detect at the cellular level that's coming from outside of us. Foods, microbes, drugs, plants, toxins, pollutants, and the largest and the, the largest growing category. I don't use them myself, but you know, maybe at some point when I do more TV, I'm gonna have to wear more makeup, right? <laughs> but cosmetics. Or a huge category of exogenous metabolites, things that are we can actually measure at the cellular level. And they're, they're also called endogenous metabolites, which are things that are um, on our cellular level that are inside of us. The anaerobic organism is our ability to make energy without oxygen. Um, aerobic organism is our mitochondria. Microorganisms are our microbiota. And specialized organisms are the organisms inside of us that make hormones. So we're talking about hormones and also cytokines. This includes neurotransmitters. So what all of this means is that we can measure all of this stuff at the metabolomic level, at the metabolite level, in the real time, what's happening right now for you and make clinical assessments of this work 
and then use this clinical work to help you optimize your foundational health. And they're all detectable and quantifiable. And so we're looking at, again, at what's called the metabolomic level. Okay, so we know that in the genes, the genes tell you what can happen, what's transcribed what is what appears to be happening, what's in the proteins is what makes it happen, but the metabolomic level is what's actually what has happened and what is happening. So looking at genes by themselves is just not enough. In fact, it may just be misguided entirely. You may get all worried about having Alzheimer's, but in, in the end, your genes are not your destiny. And we know this already. And so this is the main science we use in health optimization medicine, along with some with, with epigenetics, which I'll talk about in a minute. So for me, as a hyperbaric clinician, if somebody's energy metabolism is all screwed up, if they can't make energy well, they're not going to do well in a chamber. And this is how it became so obvious to me that this needed to be a part of my assessment for as many people as I could convince that this needed to be part of the assessment. So if your vitamins are in the tank here, this is one of our home hope dashboards that we use to assess people. If your antioxidant levels are in the tank and I'm giving you oxidative stress in a hyperbaric tank, then you are not going to do well or as well as you could in a hyperbaric environment. This is the citric acid cycle. This is how we make energy. This is something that I learned in medical school, but I had no idea we could actually use the metabolites, each piece along the way, to actually assess and understand how well you're making energy. Anybody taking NAD here? NAD is really important, right? Because this, this, the pool of NAD goes down as we get older. And so we can look at the various aspects of the citric acid cycle and understand how much NAD you might need. And of course, there's ways to supplement this and use this framework to help. If you're mercury or toxic and other heavy metals, you're not going to make energy well again. So these are why these are ways that I started to learn why my patients weren't doing as well in hyperbaric environments as they could. And if your oxidative stress markers are elevated, if your glutathione level is low, you need to be supplementing with NAC, N-acetylcysteine, or maybe glutathione directly. If your lipid peroxidate levels in your urine are elevated, you need vitamin A and vitamin E and, and alpha-lipoic acid. So I often get the question, what should I supplement with? And the question is usually in somebody that hasn't measured what they need. And so I bet you 99% of the people on this call are taking supplements. How many of you have actually measured what you need? And the answer is maybe 10% of you. Maybe 20%, this is a very educated audience. So maybe 20%. But in the end, if you measure what you need, you know what you need to take, plain and simple. So this is the framework of health optimization medicine in practice. We are using a seven pillar system using metabolomics, microbiota, epigenetics, uh, the science of how genes and the environment interact, bioenergetics, which is how our mitochondria work with the outside envi environment. This is light, this is water, this is magnetism. This is from our last speaker talking about heat as well. That's part of this. Evolutionary medicine, what your ancestors grew up using and doing. Exposomics is the science of toxins. Chronobiology is, is circadian rhythms. And then hormone optimization is also the sort of eighth pillar that's going to be, be uh, something that, uh, that's going to be demonstrated um, in various levels going forward in health optimization medicine. Right now we have a seven pillar certification with this first seven. And then we also have hormone optimization being one of our first advanced modules. I practice health optimization medicine. I'm also the chief operating officer of the nonprofit. So as a practitioner and healthcare practitioner of any type, you could get certified in this and have it in your own practice. This is what I do in my own practice as well. So um, to finish off, along the path to optimizing your health, there are going to be bottlenecks. And so in addition to a, a nonprofit company, we have a for-profit company called Smarter Not Harder. So you want to address these bottlenecks smarter, but not harder, right? Our first one, as many of you know, is called Blue Canatine, the Smurf Nootropic. These are some of our friends here, Ben and uh, Ingrid and Joey, and of course myself and Dr. Ted and Pauline from our team. With our blue tongues, this is a nootropic that has a combination of nicotine, methylene blue, caffeine, and CBD. Our for-profit company addresses those bottlenecks. 
and also helps fund the nonprofit that we have. We are a precision dose company. These are pharmaceutical grade products. Methylene blue is not from fish tanks. It is a pharmaceutical grade methylene blue. Uh, CBD and caffeine, nicotine, all have certi certificates of analysis. Pharmaceutical grade nicotine, non-tobacco derived. We are in the place where we're, we're actually producing more products as well, all for these bottlenecks. Our next one actually that already was released um, and has now actually run out of supply is our Just Blue. Uh, this is our pure methylene blue trochee. More will be coming in again in stock soon. You, you guys are the first to know we have decided to make more. And if you get the Bulletproof Biohacking box in September, those will actually have Just Blue in them. So we have more coming for pain, sleep, anxiety, and others. And we're really excited to bring these all to you as these potential remedies for the bottlenecks that occur on the path to optimized health. But it's really important to think about it in that context. If you're using nootropics, but you're not optimizing your health, you are likely going to overclock your system. So don't overclock your system, optimize your health at the same time as using these fun biohacking strategies.